All right, so up next we have A.R. Mullen. She's going to be reading some um, passages from her book, Magic So Purple. All right, are you with us? Yes. Okay, great, go ahead. All right, so Ma Magic So Purple is the second book in a um, series that is known as Spectrum of Magic. I tend to write um, a lot of GLBT characters, and a lot of my series feature more than one pairing. This is an urban fantasy um, series, and it, uh, a large portion of this book is set in the Washington, D.C. area. The Washington, D.C. Metro train doors slid shut just as Brody ducked inside. Rush hour was nearly done, and only a couple dozen people were in the car. He could have taken a seat, but after six hours of sitting on his ass in meetings at the George Bush Center for Intelligence, better known as the CIA, standing was better. The train lurched as it started moving, and Brody grabbed one of the overhead rails. His phone buzzed in his pocket as he pulled it out, and it was a text from Jeff, the old Navy buddy he was staying with for the next few days. Got your key? Have to go in for a work emergency. Brody texted back. Yep, all good. Jeff Warren did computer tech for the NSA, yet another federal intelligence group. Work emergencies could be anything from some flunky with an email problem to satellite communication issues. Brody had known him for more than a decade. Guess they weren't getting together to take out, get Thai takeout together for dinner tonight. Brody put his phone back in his pocket. The next metro stop, he was idly watching people get on and off. One in particular caught his eye, tall, lean, dark hair cut corporate short, wearing a leather jacket and tan chinos, in a word, hot. The man curled an arm around one of the vertical poles and leaned against it facing toward the end of the car. Brody let himself take the full picture from the angle of the man's jaw down his toned body to the white sneakers. No harm in looking. As the man's coat swung slightly with the movement of the train, Brody saw a badge clipped to his belt and the hint of a gun holster. Law enforcement, no doubt. Given that they were in D.C., the man could work for any number of alphabet-labeled agencies. The next stop involved the exchange of a few more people. A young couple took seats midway down the aisle from Brody, and a decent glance at them sent warning flares through him. The expression on the girl's face looked like a mix of stress and annoyance. The boy took hold of her arm and squeezed it a bit, leaning in to say something in her ear. The girl shifted uncomfortably in her seat. Was it just a petty argument? The tension in the girl's posture increased. Brody watched. Did that guy just check him out? Zane McCarran leaned his hip against the pole as the train swayed. A surreptitious peek at the blonde made him bite back a smile. Thick, unruly blonde hair, wide muscular shoulders, neatly trimmed full beard and mustache, and the Washington, D.C. uniform of dress shirt, tie, blazer, and slacks made a very appealing package. Lawyer, programmer, analyst? Maybe, but Zane decided that military might be the most correct guess. The stance, the back to the wall, the way the man's eyes scanned the passengers made it well within the possibility. If so, he was a spec ops guy, because there's no way that haircut and facial hair was, was within standard military regs. There was no noticeable underlying aggression, but a definite watchful awareness. And well, crap. Zan realized he should be more aware of himself. There was a thread of hard, brutal aggression nibbling at the edge of his psychic sentences. Who? One by one, he looked at the people present. Ah, uh, the young man in the green jacket. There was anger at the young woman who sat beside him. Anger wasn't illegal. Anyone was allowed to be almighty pissed. But this was a simmering toward a boil. The young man leaned over and spoke to the woman. She radiated fear. As a magi, Zane had a deep suspicion that something rather nasty was likely to happen. As a detective for the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police, he couldn't actually do anything about the angry man who was sitting relatively immobile next to his girlfriend. Even if the two were having an argument, people were allowed to be mad. The train stopped at the next station. The couple that Zane watched stayed where they were. 
The man with the blonde hair moved slightly to make way for a boarding passenger. He met Zane's gaze for a moment, and both their eyes flickered toward the couple, who appeared to be continuing in their very quiet argument. Mm, obviously, the blonde was aware that something dubious was going on. Two more station stops occurred before the situation detonated. Suddenly, the man hauled off and slapped the woman across the face, and then proceeded to wrap his hands around her throat in a bout Four heartbeats, the blonde military guy grabbed the boyfriend, hauled him back off the woman, breaking the man's grip around her throat. He twisted the boyfriend's arm up behind him and swept the idiot's feet out from under him. Zane pulled the woman to a safe position and helped the blonde pin the assailant to the floor of the train car. Metro PD, you're under arrest for assault and battery. Zane pulled out his handcuffs from the pouch at the back of his belt and used them on the still struggling assailant who was pinned to the floor with the blonde guy's knee in his back. Can you keep him in one, one place while I call a squad car to pick him up? No problem. Zane spent a couple of minutes on his phone calling for a quick pickup. Before he turned to the woman, he, eased, he had eased her into a seat a number of steps away from her attacker. Are you okay? Do I need to have them send an ambulance too? I'm okay. Just rattled, she said softly. I knew he was an asshole, but I didn't think he'd try to hurt me. Zane nodded and completed the information he was giving to the dispatcher. To the blonde man, he said, I'd really like you to come with me and give a witness statement when the uniforms get here. Can you do that? Yeah, sure. Outside the next metro station, the assailant was loaded into a squad car. Brody stood a few feet away, waiting. The dark-haired cop said goodbye to the uniform officers and came to talk to Brody. Thank you for helping me with deal with that moron, the cop said. <laughs> I'm not into watching women get hurt. The man stuck his hand out. Zane McCarran, I'm one of the district's detectives. And here I thought I was getting off work a little early today. Brody Harris. He shook hands with the detective. It was a good firm handshake and reinforced his attraction to the other man. Military? Ex-Navy. It's CIA now. It always felt a little dicey saying that out loud. But here inside the Beltway, the CIA was just another government employer. It was also probably a bad idea to lie to a cop doing his job. Ah, a spook. Do you live in the area? No, I'm stuck here for a couple of days on business at Langley. He didn't really want to be any more specific. Ah, got it. I need your full name, an address where I can contact you, and an email address. The easiest way to do this is probably have you tell me what you saw. I'll record it on my phone, type it up, send it to you, let you proof it and sign it. Okay. Brody's stomach let out an audible growl. Sorry. Yeah, you know... I was headed home before all this, and I had intentions of grabbing some dinner. Zane looked around the area near the station. There's a half-decent burger and beer place a block from here. We can eat while we do this. That sounds like a plan. Point me in the right direction. It took a few minutes to walk the distance to the restaurant. Brody took advantage of the fact that he wasn't going to be driving anywhere to order a double of Black Bush. My day was spent in meetings, excruciatingly boring, administrative-type meetings. Zane smiled. I definitely say you deserve a drink, then. They ordered food. Brody was in the need for meat and cheese, so he ordered a burger with cheddar cheese, bacon, and mushrooms. He had, he'd add an extra mile to his morning run to compensate. That took about 10 minutes to give his statement to the events to McCarran. Then conversation turned to Brody's current home address, Naval Air Station Fallon in Nevada. When I think Navy, I don't usually think the middle of the Nevada desert is prime Navy territory, Zane said. So am I even allowed to ask what you're doing if you're CIA now? Just intelligence work, and that's all I can really say. Understood. There's a lot of, I can't talk about my job inside the DC Beltway. So how far from Fallon to Vegas? Five to six hours. I drove it once. Not really my thing, the gambling part anyway. I went to a concert. I've been there once too. There was blackjack involved. What happens in Vegas? Brody said with a grin. Yeah, stays in Vegas along with 500 of my hard-earned dollars. They both laughed. Brody sifted in his chair. God, what he wouldn't give to see that smile in private, preferably with Zane buck naked underneath him. He hadn't been this drawn to another guy in ages. Food arrived, and they were both distracted for a little while. Zane leaped back. It's getting kind of loud in here. Any chance I could interest you in a beer back at my place? Is it far? A couple of metro drops in about three blocks in the DuPont Circle area. I could get a cheaper place outside the city, but given my crazy-ass job, there's a level of convenience in actually living in the district. 
Sure, sounds like a good idea. If he was reading Zane wrong and this was literally a low-key hangout time, that was okay too. A flight of concrete steps led down to his basement level apartment. Zane said, fair warning, I'm not much on housekeeping. He unlocked the door, keyed in the code to his security system when it squealed at him. Flipping on the light, he stepped the rest of the way inside and beckoned Brody in. There were books stacked haphazardly on the coffee table in the den, and a coffee cup left over from the morning. The PS4 controller was tossed on the sofa along with a hoodie. Several dry clean work shirts hung over an upholstered chair next to the sofa. Before he went any further, Dane, Dane decided maybe he should make sure he and Brody were on the same page. So, if you actually want a beer, that's cool. But I did have something a little different in mind. And since you helped me take down the asshole on the train, I'd rather not get a fist to the face. Brody grinned, grabbed Zane by the front of his shirt, and pulled him into a kiss. It was hot and filthy and sent way more than half of Zane's blood supply straight to his crotch. Finally, tilting his head back a little, Brody said, Is that what you had in mind? Mmm, hell yes. So, that gives you kind of an intro to the book. Fabulous. Left me wanting to know the rest of the scene. Any questions or comments? Um, like I said, if I, I have Facebook pre presence, I have Instagram presence. Um, oh, there we go. Me, do I write crime story? Yep. Um, I write crime in involved in the romance stories. I have a number of stories that involve cops. Um. There is a series known as San Diego Hope that involves a surgeon who eventually ends up married to an undercover cop. Um, I also have a series of short stories, some of which are all packaged into a single volume called Inches of Trust that involve a NYPD detective who ends up involved with an architect. Um, that particular series features a lot of really groaner puns. Mm -hmm. The architect character likes to uh make really bad puns don't we all sometimes <laughs> tia says great read all right thank you so much okay thank you you're welcome <laughs>